Hi, let's talk about the fascial spaces of the face. In this video, we'll talk about the clinically relevant fascial spaces of the face, being the spaces that are superior to the mandible. So there are two spaces that I'd like to discuss with you today. Uh, the first being the infraorbital, aka the canine fascial space. The infraorbital fascial space is deep to a muscle group called the quadratus labii muscle. Quadratus labii muscle consists of levator labii superioris aliquinasi. Levator labii superioris muscle. Zygomaticus minor muscle. And zygomaticus major muscle. So if we were to roughly draw the quadrilateral deep to this group of muscles, it would look like that. So, And we can see this region over here um, on the left-hand side of this individual. And we can see the infraorbital nerve coming out of the infraorbital foramen into this space. So this is a, an exquisitely well-named space. <clears throat> it's into this space that uh, odontogenic infections from maxillary teeth may travel. So if you were to have a, uh, I don't know, a, a left canine uh, infection uh, of the root tip, uh, that would very likely travel uh, if it went superficially into this space, hence the name canine fascial space. This fascial space is continuous anteriorly with the next space that I'd like to discuss with you, the buccal fascial space. But let's just draw in that border there. So there's zygomaticus uh, major, and we can see just deep to that and a little posteriorly, we have the buccinator muscle. So here is buccinator. It's peeking out from the masseter there. Uh, not too keen on that line. So maybe there's buccinator, the, the cheek muscle. And we can see, you know, that, uh, that this space runs down to the buccinator muscle, so which is the floor or the uh, deep surface of the buccal fascial space. Um, we can see the duct of the parotid gland heading through and piercing buccinator there. And we can also see a branch of V3 the buccal nerve, or the long buccal nerve, coming out of that space. Uh, one element that would be going into that space that we don't see here would be the deep facial vein. So let's take a look at, uh, at that space. So here is the margin between uh, the infraorbital space and the buccal space. So uh, everything sort of posterior and even deep to infraorbital space will be buccal fascial space. And uh, the buccal space is going to be contiguous not only with the infraorbital space, but with two other spaces that are going to be posterior to it. So if we go a little posterior lateral, we would go into the submasseteric space. So heading that way and a little laterally, everything deep to the masseter here and still superficial to the ramus of the mandible would be that submasseteric space, sometimes just called the masseteric space. So let me draw these, uh, these layers for you. So the, the most superficial layer here would be the masseter. 
and deep to the masseter would be the submasseteric space. So they named that well. And then we'd have the ramus of the mandible. And then deep to the ramus of the mandible, we would have the pterygomandibular space. And deep to that space would be the medial pterygoid muscle. Keeping in mind that the masseter and the medial pterygoid form a sling about the ramus of the mandible. So those are two muscles of mastication. So on either side of the ramus of the mandible, we have the submasseteric space, which would be superficial to the ramus, or the pterygomandibular space, which would be deep to the ramus. So let's take a look at the lateral pharyngeal space. So here we can see that pterygomandibular line, that would be a condensation of the buccopharyngeal fascia. That's the, uh, the fascia that is investing the superior pharyngeal constrictor, which we can see there as well as the buccinator muscle it would extend out that way. So that buccopharyngeal fascia uh, is upon both of these muscles. Uh, here we can see the styloid process of the temporal uh, bone. Here we can see the hyoid bone. There's the lesser horn. So there's the stylohyoid ligament there. <clears throat> If we were to conceptualize the lateral pharyngeal space, we want to think about an inverted pyramid. The, uh, the base of that pyramid is going to be against the basic cranium here. And the apex of the pyramid is going down toward the body of the hyoid, like so. And, uh, this space is going to lie lateral to the pharyngeal constrictors, specifically the superior and the middle. It doesn't really touch the inferior pharyngeal constrictor at all. And it is going to be subdivided by the, the hyoid bone there. So if we think about the spaces that this is going to be contiguous with, um, as we go superficial and slightly anterior to the space, we would have the pterygomandibular space. In that same plane of access, we'll also have the submasseteric space. And posteriorly and deep, to here. So if we were to color this in, we'll also have the retropharyngeal space. So that retropharyngeal space is retro or posterior to the pharyngeal constrictor muscles. And that represents a potential route of infection or metastasis between the uh, the pharyngeal region and the uh, the thorax. So that, that can be kind of a big deal. So let's, let's take a look at a pathway uh, by which infection can spread, or anything really. Uh, it could be an anesthetic, uh, could be um, even an air embolism. So uh, let's start here with the infraorbital space. Say we had maxillary odontogenic infection. We know that posteriorly the infraorbital space is contiguous with the buccal space, and there is overlap there. That buccal space is then going to be 
contiguous with both the submass enteric space and then deep to the submass enteric space, the pterygomandibular space. So everything blue here is represented as something that is blue and labeled on here. So these, uh, these green spaces we'll hear about in subsequent videos and discussions. Sublingual space. Uh, sublingual space is the most inferior part of the oral cavity between the mylohyoid muscle and the, uh, and the mucosal floor of the, the tongue. And the submandibular space is going to be below the level of the mandible, right? Bordered by the digastric bellies. So those spaces can communicate with one another and they can also communicate deep to that lateral pharyngeal space. So we can see how materials can move from one space to the next and even go back to the retropharyngeal space and perhaps even down to the, uh, the thoracic cavity. Um, now an infection doesn't have to make its way all the way to the thoracic cavity to pose a problem. As an infection takes root in the lateral pharyngeal space and the retropharyngeal space, this can compromise an airway and can be very problematic in, in terms of, uh, of, of having to take care of it. That would be an emergent situation. So uh, Ludwig angina is an example of uh, an infection traveling uh, through a fascial space or even from one of these earlier fascial spaces uh, providing uh, pressure or a, a block to the, uh, the airway. <clears throat> so that leads us to our assessment question, and that is an odontogenic infection from a ma maxillary canine may immediately invade which fascial space? So buccal space, it'll be in the vicinity, so let's not get rid of that yet. Uh, infraorbital or the canine space, yeah, that sounds really good to me, right? Uh, lateral pharyngeal space, nope, too far posteriorly and deep. Uh, retropharyngeal space, way too far posterior and deep. Submasseteric space, again, too far posterior, so between buccal and infraorbital. Keeping in mind the division between the two of these would be that posterior border of zygomaticus major. The canine is going to be anterior to that, so uh, buccal space is out. And the infraorbital, what's even there in the name, canine space is the correct answer for receiving an odontogenic infection from a maxillary canine. Thank you very much for your time.